That Ford C3 in there that we pulled out of Lake Speed Senior's garage. Like he was saying, those guys had modern engines and all that. He was way down in horsepower compared to those guys with this old engine. So he's saying we can get that engine freshened up, put it back in that car, yeah. and get you back in the car. Right now we're standing in the quality lab at CP Carrillo. So that's Lake Speed Junior. You've seen him before, at least I hope you have. We got some really awesome piston stuff going on right now. The old piston from 20 something years ago versus the new piston we're putting in that C3 right now. And Brian here is gonna tell us all about it because he designed the new one. Exactly, he's the piston guru. So we had to, we gotta find a lot of horsepower, right? We were 480, we're down at least 180 horsepower. So we gotta get a lot of power. So you gotta come to the guys who make the horsepower, piston guys. So this was easy to try to pick it up. And it was cool is that we had the original pistons were CP pistons, so they already knew what we, got, what we had. And this is that old school, I mean, of course, I say this is old school, but really, Brian, for the time, for 2002, this was, that was state of the art, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah pretend it's 2002. Then. What made this piston so great over what was there in 1992? Yeah, I mean, basically, you know, it's just the evolution of the part. Um, a lot of it has to do with things that you may not even be able to see. A lot of it has to do with the functionality of the machine work that mm -hmm. is being done on the part. Uh, the tolerances, the way that you hold the part, the, the finishing processes and steps and how to finish ring grooves and all those little details. Yeah, stuff you really can't see just yeah. looking at I me. Mean, obviously you can see so a you big difference. See, you can see the difference between them now, for sure. But back then, <laughs> you know, it, it might have been a progressive step in the right direction, you know, but uh, so nowadays you got your narrower skirts, you got your tighter clearances, you got Ring groove clearances are totally different. Ring package is totally different, which mm -hmm. you can evaluate on that. Um, you got gas ported pistons and gas ported rings. We've got gussets and, and support systems where it needs to be. All the while, it, it's still a rather small bore, so the amount of opportunities we have with different forging design isn't as big as some of the common bore sizes in today's mm -hmm. NASCAR engines, but we make it work with what we have. We could always go bill it. We could do this, we could do that. Um, but this worked out really well for you guys. And what we did is we shortened the wrist pin okay. uh, in order to tighten up the small end of the rod, keep the pin engagement where it needs to be. So we're using the same connecting rods. So this area again. here is wider than that area. Obviously you can see it. Yes. And so this was a 2750 long pin. This is a two and a half inch long pin. Uh, but by narrowing the small end of the rod, we'll still have a decent amount of pin engagement in the piston, even with a shorter wrist pin. Got it. So. What is that? Is that cut the the rotating weight? Uh, yeah, it does. At the end of the day, the the whole assembly weight of the package is whatever that is, but. Uh, what we're trying to do is on these forgings nowadays, the way that they're forged in the design of mm -hmm. them, they're not going to accommodate the longer wrist pins, right? So in order to take advantage of the design changes, everything's tighter, everything's narrow, the rods are narrower, the pins are shorter, the pins are smaller in diameter. Um, this particular one is the same pin diameter mm -hmm. and we're just going to narrow the pin into the connecting rod that right. you have yeah. because we're reevaluating the safety margin and making sure that it's okay to do so and there's ratios and certain calculations you do for that stuff and um, so like if we were using new rods, not reusing the old rod. We'd change the wrist pin size, we'd make everything smaller, the beam would be narrower, and so on and so forth. It'd be smaller everywhere. More compact. And you'd probably have different forging opportunities at that point. Because of that. And, uh, and so on and so forth. So Now when you go to that narrower pin, that makes the pin stiffer too, right? Sure. It's a combination of wall thickness mm -hmm. as well as length. Um, but yes, you're tightening it all up, you're bringing it all down, so it's not gonna, not gonna be moving around as much, especially That's if- That's the key thing. Especially if it's a similar wall thickness, but yeah. you can also play with the wall thickness of the material to, to yield different results. Get that strength that. back, yeah. Because yeah. that wrist pin really is the backbone of the piston. Yes. Yeah, because it's, it's the strong part and all this, and you want to keep it, yes. you want to make all this light, but you still have to have the strength where you need it so that it well, maintains and if, its structure. And if you look at the difference in the structures here, mm -hmm. this one is actually flexing in a different way than this one. 
Got so it. the same wrist pin in these two designs wouldn't always work either. Ooh, see, that's why you hang out with this guy. You learn stuff. Well, the load on the inside edge of the pin boards are totally different because the forgiving part of this forging is not the same as this one. Right. So. Now with this, they call this a box style, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, it's a, so for us, we, we refer to it as an X style or a box style. Okay. Uh, there's fully boxed, there's partially boxed, uh, and then you have round, right? So yeah, this okay, is yeah. what we would call Full round. round. Yeah. And then this is a box. The, the ribs here are cut down so that when the rod angles at 90 degrees on the crankshaft, your connecting rod doesn't make contact to the box. Um, and, but it still gives it but support. But it still gives it support and ties everything together. And then you put your windows in there to lessen the weight and allow oil to move around and mm -hmm. get where it needs to be. So is this, so this design here is almost like a hybrid of the the old way versus the new way. Because you're saying if the the yeah. way they're made now, like the current yeah, it's, NASCAR uh, pistons are totally different. Is here as far as dimensions. Yeah, what we're doing is. It's not only a hybrid because of the bore size, but also because we're using the same rod over again. Exactly. Right? Yeah. So this is that happy medium of being able to utilize the parts that you have in the engine mm -hmm. and still come up with something trick and new that is able to get you back where you need to be, hopefully on the power scale and, and, and make some improvements along with your ring package and all that stuff. Yeah, because that's the biggest thing we did here, right? Is we, same bore size essentially, but mm -hmm. 60, went from a four, 060 to a 4065 to yeah. just clean it up and we had yeah. rings available for that so we went, we're going from this was an 043 1.5 millimeter three millimeter ring package yes. and this is a 0.7 millimeter 0.7 millimeter two millimeter ring package so we've quite a difference yeah and today's not so trick but trick right oh yeah, exactly yeah so yeah, yeah there's yeah there's some stuff out there today that's a little thinner than that a little more advanced than that yeah. but this is still pretty cutting edge yeah not too not too shabby actually no nope. looking forward to that and this was an old this was a, a duck bomali top ring and this one will have a steel pvd coated top ring mm -hmm. what's pvd mean so that's uh physical vapor deposition so the molly type ring is you spray on a molly coating and what's cool about the molly is it's soft but also has porosity so molly because it's porous holds oil which means the cylinder finish didn't have to be as it could be smoother essentially and that's where you get your your plateau that we did with the greg anderson pwn yeah, video exactly so with the steel ring with the pvd coating there's no porosity it wouldn't hold any oil that's why we had to have that special plateau hone so the cylinder has to hold all the oil when you go to a steel ring especially when, with pvd coatings on it so really even the gas nitride ring is the same thing either gas nitride or pvd if it's a steel ring there's no porosity you got to have the cylinder wall hold all the oil with the old duck molly rings you, it held its own oil so you could get away with a smoother finish the problem with that was being smoother it didn't hold the oil but with the molly being softer it didn't last as long so those old these old rings would be worn out in a 500 mile race yeah. And on the OEM side, is that why, you know, the old school stigma is, oh, that car has 100,000 miles on it, the motor's worn out, where oh, yeah. nowadays it's not like that because they're using different... Similar technology in the OEM world as, as well. Yep. It makes yeah, a lot you, of sense. Yeah, the thinner steel ring, because that steel being a better material lets you make it thinner and you don't lose any strength that way or any ability. It's actually more conformable. It's got better tensile strength to it. So steel is a better material. And then that PVD type of coating, which think of it, if you've got a yellow drill bit at home, like a gold drill bit in your mm -hmm. drawer, and you're like, well, that's titanium nitride. That's a PVD type coating. In fact, that's exactly the same kind of coating we're gonna put on these rings, is a titanium nitride, which is like 2,400 Vickers hardness. So that old school Molly ring is about 800 Vickers hardness. This is literally, you know, three times harder. So it should last three times longer, which is what we typically see in a NASCAR deal, right? The old days, that Molly ring would last about one race, about 500 miles, it'd be worn out. Today's stuff will run 1,500, 1,600 race miles, and it's still good. Yeah. So is that how those, uh, the Ilmore spec engines work now? How they can run multiple races on those things without having to change them all the time? Yeah, th those, those are CRNs. That's a chromium nitride. It's not as hard as the titanium nitride, but that's the whole thing. PVD is basically a 
a family of coatings. So DLC, which we're going to have on the wrist pin, yep. is a type of PVD coating. You got CRN, uh, which is popular on titanium valves. Uh, it's, mm -hmm. it's used in a lot of things. We actually use that on our AP steel rings. And then the titanium nitride is also a type of uh, PVD coating, which again, the drill bits and anybody that works in a machine shop that's used a gold insert, yep. cutting insert, that's titanium nitride. So it helps extend the life of the parts, makes things better. So really that's what's cool about this is we're taking this old school uh, part, which was cutting edge at the time, but now we're updating it, same bore size essentially, but we're adding all the new technology to it. And we're getting some compression bump too, which is kind of nice. That too, definitely doesn't hurt. Were you able to actually figure out what the compression was with these pistons? Because every time I ask that question, nobody has an answer for me. Well, I think Dennis, Dennis and I might have gone back and forth on it. I can't recall at the moment exactly what it was, but we can get into that and go, go yeah. play with the calculator or something if we have to. Yeah, we know the engine was a nine to one engine at the time. Yeah. Right? We're Yeah. So it wasn't more than that. Yeah. <laughs> Hope it wasn't no, a lot less than that. <laughs> you know, but what's what's neat is to see that evolution of technology over time. Now, what's interesting here is with this type of piston design. We've all been in a situation at some point in our lives where we could use a little extra cash for something. Maybe a great deal on some car parts just came up and you wanna go get them right now. Dave is the banking app that can help you get up to $500 instantly with extra cash. That's more money to fill your tank, buy some car parts, or catch up on bills. You can finally tackle those expenses that have been stressing you out without any hangups. There's no interest and no credit check needed. Millions of people have already downloaded the Dave app to get the financial relief they need with extra cash. So if you're in a pinch and need some extra help, download Dave and think of it as a helping hand from future you. Download Dave today at dave.com slash stapleton. That's dave.com slash stapleton. Sign up for an extra cash account and get up to $500 instantly. For terms and conditions, go to dave.com slash legal. Instant transfer fees apply. Banking provided by Evolve member FDIC. Future you will thank you. Is the the undercrown area here, is that the weakest area? Uh, or is, am I wrong on that? You know, I, I don't know if I would say it's the weakest. It really just depends on what the cross sections are and how thick. Uh, you can get away with less and something like that that's got more support. Mm -hmm. But, you know, the mentality of it, obviously you're not going to make gobs of power more than, than you anticipated back then. You know, right. we're just hoping to get a little more with the rings and a little more with the piston and a little more here and a little more there. Yeah. Uh, if it was making tons more power, then it would be a different approach. Got it. But for for just simplicity. The thickness under the undercrown basically is based on the application. Yeah. yeah. And it also depends, you know, on how that lays out with the forging. You can see this one area is milled yep. and the rest aren't. Uh, trying to balance the part, do some of the processes all in one, on one go and mm -hmm. not changing tools and and then you got to follow the contour of the pockets and all that stuff on the bottom where you didn't necessarily have the pocket on this one on the exhaust. All right, so one thing I've already seen that you did, because we were back to the same rod length, so we know that the compression height is the same, but that top ring groove height, you mm -hmm. moved the top ring up. Why did you do that? Well, because you're, the area between the valve pocket and the ring groove is, that's one of the points that tells you where to put it. Okay. And if your reduced radial mm -hmm. thickness is being used on your new piston, then you can yield a similar thickness and move it up. Right. And we already know that, you know, obviously this thing's gone a good long while. It didn't hurt anything. Uh, we have a pretty good idea of what we can get away with in that area. And so that we were able to move it up. Because there's a little bit of horsepower there, right? By oh, moving sure. that ring groove up. Sure. You don't want to puddle any more fuel or have anything being left around the top ring mm -hmm. then that doesn't need to be there, so. And I also see that it's actually radius right there at the, at the edge, yeah. where the old ones, they didn't do that. It may have had a radius on there, or it might have been tighter. Somebody might have trimmed the top of this thing a little bit. Okay, okay. You really don't right. know. Um, some, sometimes that was common back in the day, they'd take two thou off the top, or five thou off the top, or whatever. The radii on the on the edge of the piston is a little bit bigger than it than it was before, but we can adjust all that stuff. It's literally just clicking buttons and moving parts and mm -hmm. pieces in the computer to make whatever we want pop out on the CNC machine. So let's see how you do that. If you're wondering, we are going to have a separate video just about the factory. We'll show you what those forgings look like when they're raw and how they turn into what you see now. But 
this video is for the technical side of Lake Speed's particular engine resurrection here. So this is the file right here. This is what you... Yeah, this is what we used to design the piston for Lake. So, you know, no big deal. 32 thousandths between the top ring and the intake pocket, right? I mean, that's... <laughs> something like that um but but it's also what was that it, it's very <laughs> what was that but it's basically it's not much at all but it's almost double what we've run being totally comfortable in, in a similar application okay. so uh and it's in one pinpointed area it's not like the whole side of the piston right and that's kind of what we look at to determine where we want to put it and that's that's pretty safe um to be honest with you so as machined it looks like this but yeah. then, like you said but that machining process can put residual stresses and things in there so then you sharp feed it and it takes those stresses out there's also there's subtle differences in the the actual part versus this as well since it's a solid model you know sometimes you got radii and little this and a little of that and i know that it's going to be safer than that by a couple thousand in manufacturing so um but here's a look at you know the part cross-sectioned in comparison to what it used to be so you you have a model in here the old one too yeah that's the one on this side over here how did you find a did you have to did you actually pull that up from 2002 you had a file for i it? did and as you can see there's some things in there that i didn't realize were there that um uh, you know we could clean up but yeah um we have database and records for the whole history of the company. So all we got to do is find the job and then we can build the thing and take a look at it and and uh, compare and contrast the differences. Huh. So when, you're, when you start to make a file like this, do you start with something else that's kind of close or do you start with the raw slug? In its, no, in its... we we here at CP Carrillo have actually created quite a bit of automation, which is really cool because we have the database where we can go and we can grab the actual part that was, we were referencing. I can go grab something else that's going to be used on the forging I intend to use. Mm -hmm. And when I first started, yeah, you would start with a forging and it would be nothing. And then you would hand draw every single feature one by one and it might take me an hour or more to get a weight. Now, we basically type a job number in and then we use all kinds of automation to go and grab the forging, grab the data from the, from the computer database, put it into the design sheet and then it manufacture, well it cuts it on screen or, or models it on the screen and then it's literally just the touch of a button now. Huh. So, um, but that's not done that's just to start with and then now i got to take all the information that yourself yep. and dennis have given me i got to run a compression calculator if i need to do that but dennis says let's just make a flat top piston so we make a flat top piston and then i got to get the rod beam with and swing it with the crank and make sure that it's not going to hit the ribs and start cutting and, and whittling away at it and what are we going to narrow the pin into the rod to? Okay, we came to an agreement on that. That's what we're going to make the width of the bosses with this much clearance, shorten the wrist pin, and then you just start dabbling through and until you get to where you want to be. Huh. Well, if you're allowed to show us, would you be able to compare Lake's new piston to a current nascar style piston to see yeah. where the compromises have actually been made yeah, i mean we have a variety of nascar piston like something that's in an engine today is probably not going to be you know shown or whatever but i have old stuff um we something have, to illustrate what you're talking about with having to i mean we compromise have, with the wrist have, pins like experimental stuff things to talk about we got some old nationwide stuff um you know you can see the differences between the what width is, what is this this, is, this is a total this is this is a trade show piston that's based <laughs> on a nascar part and since it's not relatable to one particular team we can show you that and talk about it okay so that's why i'm grabbing that one um and it's very similar to uh something that would be used today i mean even this piston here is basically the same thing rods narrower i mean 
we can go grab the rods there on the other CMM, but you can see the beam and all the differences. Mm -hmm. And if you want, we can go grab that and pop something off, off of, off of this and take a look at the difference. Yeah, because if we were going to try to turn like higher RPM, like we're not really going to try to turn this thing to the moon, yeah. RPM wise, that would be something we would have to address was yeah. the rod. Yeah. Well, like we said a, a moment ago, if you were just getting new rods, period, then we would change everything. everything. And it wouldn't necessarily be unsafe to do so. We would make sure the safety is plenty fine mm -hmm. and you would be more than happy with everything with smaller wrist pins and narrower rods, but we're using the old rods again. Yeah. Because Carrillo's last a good long time. Exactly. Yeah. Right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, that's kind of cool. Talk about that real quick, right? I mean, these things are 20 year, 27 well, yeah, years I mean, old, right? right? What I'd like to do is I'd like to get Richard because, yeah, let's do that. because he said that he was possibly in the production department and he might have even been hands on manufacturing them. We got to do that. Uh, yeah, get Richard. We'll yeah. go find him. And then we can go look at the rods on the CMM on the Carrillo side. Yeah. And then we can get into conversations about that if you like. Let's do that. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Let's go bother Richard. Okay. All right. <laughs> so we found Richard. There he is, there's Richard. <laughs> and there's Snake. Richard's gonna tell you a little history on the connecting rods that are being measured back here, um, as well as the company and, and how we do things today. Okay. Yeah, um, so these rods were made in 1997, 1998. You put them together, right? Yeah, I was actually working in the shop at the time when those were manufactured, so I actually worked on the small ends of the rods. About the time they were moving to smaller crank pins and lighter rods, in the beginning of it, they're still kind of heavy by today's standards. Um, yeah, these are. Yeah. But those are pretty light back for their then, day. Uh, compared to the Speedway cap stuff you're running, which is probably 780 grams, mm -hmm. those are probably, probably closer to like 690 maybe. Okay. Yeah, that because that's the interesting thing. You're saying you look these things up, and you ever ma manufactured? You said ninety seven. Ninety seven. Ninety seven is when they were started. All right. So we know Dad bought those engines at an auction. I think in two thousand one. You know these pistons were made in two thousand two. I think. Right. So obviously these rods were already been raced and used in that those two used engines he bought at an auction. Yeah. Then they were still in good enough shape. They reused them again and ran and all here. those vintage races again, and now they're still. 20 something years later, <laughs> we're gonna use them again. Because <laughs> yeah. they're, they're still pretty good. So, pretty good connecting rod, I think. We used to have a plaque in our office for a long time ago that had one of the rods from the inaugural uh, Brickyard 400, which Jeff Gordon won. Yeah. And that's how I remembered that that was a Speedway cap rod. And that was like 94, I think it was, or 96? Okay. 94. 94. Was a good 94. Yeah. yeah. Tell them what this thing is doing. So that, that, this is how we know we can still use this, right? After all these years, it's not just like you look at it with your well, we naked gotta, eye and say, we hey, still gotta decipher the results and, and let you know okay, okay, how, okay. how good or bad they are. So what's it measuring right now? Explain what some people who are watching what this machine is and what it's doing. It's actually a CMM and it's actually measuring the bore <clears throat> diameter here. Um, at this piston here, previously we were measuring the small end bore diameter and then it calculates the distance to distance on the center to center. And they were also checking the faces as well so they can verify that the face to bore is perpendicular and not tapered or out of back. So if something's gonna wear out on these, what is it? Typically it's the housing board will go undersized and it needs to be clipped or summed up. And sometimes the bushings will need to get replaced. And those like also too, because it's measuring all those locations on the sides top and bottom if the rod was somehow bent or twisted yeah, it would, you can see it like yeah. because we we do know that it ran hot was overheating it's pushing a little bit of water so in case somehow or another when it was doing that we you know it didn't really hydro lock it but if yeah. it did and bent it you can see it that way and this will project it out to four inches so that you can see the bend and twist at four inches not just a, the sides of the one inch of the oh, okay so yeah. it kind of amplifies it so right so it's actually seeing what is actually in the motor you know okay the distances the distances okay right? perfect okay yeah because if you make it you know straight at this distance here when you put it in the motor the piston could be tilted so if you check it at four inches you have a better chance that you know it's not going to be tilted the piston yeah then well, we just start pointing at each other it's like hey no man no <laughs> <laughs> well you know he said something earlier in the video that a lot of the stuff that makes a big difference you can't see with yeah. your naked eye yeah. And I think that's the whole story here is, is this snake about all this machinery. You, you gotta have, these are not cheap. 
right? No, yeah. we have quite. We started year. making our first piston. We built the inspection room. So you know, round column to check flatness of ring grooves, check the cam profile, make sure everything is is right on, and yeah. also CMMs. And we had to, we thought we had to have, and we did need to have better equipment than what our customers had. The engines are systems, I and mean, all these parts have to talk to each other. It's not just about having that piston. Yeah, it's really great yeah. that it's new and all this but it has to be able to work with the rod and it yeah. has to work with the ring and the ring has got to work with the hone. They, they all have to work as a system. They're not just individual components. You know, you don't just add up all the sum of the parts and say, well, that's what it is. It's yeah. Well, even nowadays, we actually compare measurement results with our clients as well. And we'll talk about how you hold it, how you measure it, the filters being used on the machines, mm -hmm. dissect the way that we're measuring it, the climate control, all the different aspects of that so that that way we're on the same wavelength and we can talk the same language and they can measure and get the same that we get. And then, yeah. then you can take it and start measuring all the other stuff and adding it all together but it really allows you to speak the same language because in some of these teams they're they're doing a lot of work on their end and and if you're off they're going to catch you and you need to be able to to discuss that stuff there's so. also a soaking period when we bring the parts in from the shop that could be one temperature it could be 80 degrees out that day so that there's a soaking period where they need to sit in here for half a day or a day to come to the right temperature oh yeah and that makes a difference i know we've done yeah. it before yeah. and the, we were doing the cam testing when i worked at gibbs yeah. and we were doing us up with the oil we had fly cams to memphis to have them measure them on the ad call well that airplane's at you know fifty thousand feet mm -hmm. and if you've ever been to memphis i mean comps a mile from fedex right mm -hmm. and so they could literally run down there grab the cams run them up and throw them in there they would be so cold from being up at altitude because yeah. they're not sealing the cabin in the back yeah. of a cargo <laughs> deal yeah. that it would actually throw off the measurement sometimes they had to let, let them sit is that thing done now we're gonna find out if they're good we'll have to get back to you on that <laughs> 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 some of this is impromptu right i mean we're we are measuring yeah but we've been so busy that we haven't had a chance to measure and look at the results until right now yeah. either yeah. so right. you yeah. say it's good i'm good with it yeah the other stuff could be corrected i mean it's a matter of resizing it, so. yeah if you so it, it looks like the diameters are what's out which is pretty much what he said is normal mm -hmm. and that's pretty much what dennis is going to be working on anyway okay he's going to rebush rebush the small end anyway yeah so that's easy on, enough. On that one rock. Stuff you would do anyway. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. So that just goes to show you that these old rods are still, still good kicking. Enough. What are we looking at in here? <laughs> so obviously we have our old piston and our new piston, but just for fun, we've also said, okay, here's what old school we call this a speedway cap. Speedway cap, or we call it a super, we call it a super cap, but a lot of people call it refer to it as a speedway cap. All right. So that was. Old school NASCAR yeah, from the 80s and 90, early 90s. And you said this one weighs 760 grams. Yeah. You, you can't see my scale here, right? The same design was run in uh, the uh, inaugural Brickyard 400. Right. So that's the 1994 Brickyard 400 winning type rod. Mm -hmm. And this is, at that point, this, well, this is uh, five years later, essentially, or even three years later. Three years later, we're going to that. Yeah. And you can see the difference also between these two. Off the shelf part of the time, too. And why did you not have to have this big, these big fins on here? Is there a difference in the material design or just your understanding of just what it could not, handle? Not, it was overkill for the application is what it was. Yeah. Uh, it was way more rod than they needed. And, you know, and then the, as the team started looking at, hey, how can we lighten rotating assemblies, get them better and still maintain the uh, durability? Started moving to that and then slowly started moving into <laughs> smaller journals, smaller wrist pins everything just some guiding stuff so they run the narrow the big ends down to like 820 thousandths wide right just barely enough to cover the bearing and guide it by the piston and they get that narrow you have to start adding meat to the outside to try to help increase that footprint of the split line got it yeah so we do develop the lip caps will be added material without increasing the width uh. yeah that's a good point yeah because right here that, that where the split is you're adding material here to give it enough strength yeah because everything gets lighter and lighter and lighter because you don't want that to bend. 
This one's probably 620, maybe 606 to 620 thick. These were like 630 thick. And then now when you get to these, they're like 585. Or even thinner, some of them got down to like 565. How many grams is this one? That was probably 530 grams. What era did these type of rods start to become normal? Early 2000s, I think, maybe late 1990s. Oh, when it started getting really... It started off with the... Really crazy. Yeah, it started off... pins. Yeah. Some of the two ring stuff like we were talking about. Mm -hmm. Light, light, everything. And then it kind of kind of has gone backwards a yeah. little since then because of rules, regulations, finances, trying to keep cars together. Exactly, yeah. Not who has the most money wins. Yeah. It's a lot easier as the crew Forever. guys to not have to change engines four yeah. times a weekend. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I remember those days. This is like the raw that goes with that. And this would have been... That can go for both, obviously, mm -hmm. right? Because it is. Yep. So the advancement is in the piston on that side and then the piston that would have gone with this would have been very yeah, comparable like that, to that yeah. and the moral of the story is yes keeping the same block heads manifold crank and rods we're doing everything we can to make this thing better but we haven't gone to the extreme there's yeah if we wanted to really just go full at it no budget no cost thought, thought mind there's a whole lot more we could have, we could have done. We just haven't. But it's also saying how good the parts are that you had in there from the beginning, right? That really is the, the moral of the story right there, is that right. the parts we had were at actually really, really good at the time. Yeah. And you don't really have to make huge changes in order to be able to make hopefully well over 700 horsepower. Yes. I mean, if you wanted to go crazy, could you hog those heads out more and then do something like this in there and spin it to 9,600 and Oh, God, I me! Mean, if, if you, you took all the technology that's available now, you could take those same heads, that same block, and then we could bore the thing out. You could put a new crank in there, shorten the stroke up, make everything super light, build a qualifying engine, and that thing could probably, yeah, turn 10,000 piece of cake. Who knows how much power it'd make, especially with the day's fuels and stuff. I mean, yeah. think about the Australian V8 or the Australian Pro Stock stuff. Yes. Yep. Four hundred cubic inch small block. Yep. And they make over a thousand horsepower in A. Did not know that. Yeah. yeah. So it's impressive. Course. Yeah. But that's not the moral of your story. No. The moral <laughs> of your story is sticking with what you had, taking the incremental steps the right way to get back where you need to be with a little extra, hopefully. Right. Right. Yeah. That. Yeah. This is taking what you've got, finessing it, doing the stuff that you can't see. This is the more regular regular Joe way to go. Yes, exactly, yeah. yeah. Because the Australian pro stock stuff is absolutely insane and nuts. <laughs> yeah. Like most things in Australia, they're a little bit over the edge. Like they like to be on the on the edge and a little bit radical. Yeah. Must be all the snakes down there or something, yeah, I think. <laughs> you know? We have one snake floating around in here too, but <laughs> <laughs> Yes well. sir. So that's uh that's where we're at. And uh, it yeah. looks like you got some, some good parts to put this thing back together. You know, it's, it's seven sixteenths bolts in too. Seven sixteenths? Yeah, so three eighths. All those little things add up, right? Mm -hmm. Well, that's the other moral of the story, right? Is that, yeah, doing this the average way of not throwing everything out and starting from scratch and going crazy, taking what you got, refining it, and this little things adding up. Yeah. And I think it's also a matter of communicating with the people in the industry and, and thank you for working with us. And anybody can call in here and talk and, and ask questions and figure out the right way to go with what they have available to them too, right? Yeah, you guys do this for people like us all day long, right? Not yeah, just, that's, I mean, we've, we've known each other for a long time yeah. and everything, but yeah. you don't have to be somebody that no. can be brand new, call up CP no. today. And, I mean, don't get me wrong, you need to have your information. You yes, need, you you need have to have, have answer. the information. You gotta have yes. the info to answer yes. the questions because yes, we're gonna exactly. ask you questions. Right. Uh, but, but like Richard said earlier, this might not be the most common length today, but it's still available in the catalog if you really want it. Yeah. So. And the reality is just because you have an old Corolla rod doesn't mean you need to get new ones. No. I'm sure they would like you to, but you don't have to. You don't have to, right? <laughs> well, to, to be honest with you, I mean, 
to rework and recondition an old set of rods is not the strength of the company anymore. We do offer it, but it's very time consuming because they go through a lot of work to make sure that they're as good as a new product when they're done, right? Yeah. So um, if you rework a rod, it's still not necessarily cheap, but it's cheaper than the right. alternative. But you got to remember how long these things last, you know, made in America, this is still <laughs> proof, going back Yeah, proof in. of the pudding, yeah, yeah. 25 yeah. years later, it's still running. Yeah, that's, that's know, the thing is like a lot of these rods in some of the pro classes that they run in, they last longer than the chassis. Yeah. <laughs> that's the end of it right there, right? They do. I mean, I've, I've got guys with boats and they're like blown gas and Chevrolet, this thing is, I've had these rods in for 25 years and... I mean, they'll last longer than the holes or the chassis that you put them in if, if you don't have a catastrophic failure and you don't have lubrication problem or right, yeah, oil else. pump go out or whatever yeah. other especially, issues. Especially when you're taking something off the shelf that's designed for way more than what you're doing, it's just gonna last longer. Yeah. So yeah. I get customers calling, they wanna make the rods for a thousand horsepower engine, and I'm like, well, a thousand horsepower today, what are you doing in two years? Yeah, where are you gonna be? That. Yeah. Build for that because then you're not spending the money again and going, oh crap, I'm gonna buy rods again. And you're gonna be happier and you're always gonna be like, oh man, I'm gonna go back to CP Carrillo. Well, and I mean, by having an increased safety margin, you know, at the end of the day, what are the gains for not taking advantage of that opportunity? Right. And can, can those guys really measure that? Is it an all out race application or is it something that they want to last for a long time, you know? Yeah. There's a difference between trying to win a race versus trying to set a world record. Mm -hmm. You know? And then there's bracket racing. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Which, no discredit to anybody for any of that stuff, but no. you don't need to to be on the on the verge of failure if you're trying to run the number. And right. you know, do something different. Like change something else and have 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 the, the heart and soul of your engine and the foundation good for what you're trying to do for a good long while like you yeah. said so yeah. that's what we another try to moral do. of the story right yeah. there's, there's several morals in this story here right yeah. that here if you understand learn. the application that makes it better for making the decisions on where you should put your money what parts do you need to invest in yeah. because if you rely invest in reliability if that's the ultimate goal is to have longevity you to put the money where it needs to be not necessarily lighter maybe have, invest in exactly. the durability if you're trying to set a world record well then you got to invest in lighter faster because that's what you're trying to do yeah so we can see how the stuff gets made now yes we can go show them how to make the stuff now okay you're gonna have to go watch that video now we're gonna go film it so i guess are the rods and pistons kind of made in conjunction or do they have separate line areas which one are we going to see uh, first we, we manufacture them in two different sides of the shop um they're they are divvied up for a variety of reasons number one they're different components 